kingdoms, what comes to your mind? <laughs> what kind? <laughs> I it's had a, to say it because I really wanted. That's right. I mean, do you, do, do you imagine uh, ancient civilizations that existed hundreds of years ago whose way of life could easily be described as you know, backward or primitive or otherwise antithetical to, to modern life that we're used to? And how about kings themselves, African kings? Would you maybe visualize them as these you know, elderly gentlemen with pot bellies? <laughs> draped in traditional regalia, you know, mostly consisting of animal skins, you know, lion skin there, leopard skin here. Or perhaps what comes to mind is King Shala, <laughs> or maybe Naniska, the indomitable woman king. What if I told you that contrary to popular imaginations, African kingdoms are in fact modern. They are timeless. And that in addition to having a rich repertoire of cultural practices and traditions, African kingdoms also have unique political and economic institutions that are applicable to modern life. And that while kings may indeed wear traditional regalia occasionally, they also wear business suits and command the boardrooms of multinational corporations. Today I would like to introduce to you the idea of African kingdoms as corporate organizations in the governance of natural resources instead of governance. This is because the conventional model of resource governance, which involves governments and international companies having exclusive control of the entire value chain of natural resources, has not worked. Instead, the presence of high value natural resources, such as oil and minerals, has mostly been associated with harmful outcomes. And this includes political and economic instability, environmental degradation, and there's only one country in Africa that has escaped this. And this phenomenon is popularly known as the resource curse. And yes, it's counterintuitive. And when I discovered this concept, it took me a little while to, to understand it. But so more money, more problems? <laughs> I just can't get that. Unfortunately, the resource curse mostly affects people who live in the rural areas because most of these resources are extracted from rural regions. So folks who live in these areas end up experiencing you know, very difficult circumstances such as losing their homes, losing sources of livelihood such as you know, agricultural and pasture land, they lose access to fisheries, and they also have to move away from sacred religious sites such as ancestral burial grounds. And this is in addition to other pre-existing forms of impov uh, impoverishment um, which a lot of African you know, rural areas experience, such as the lack of decent housing, the absence of modern amenities like electricity, internet, and so forth. Now, I've experienced these this kinds of impoverishment firsthand uh, as the son of rural elementary school teachers. For example, I remember as a little boy pushing a wheelbarrow full of plastic containers with, you know, safe drinking water, I would, I would ask myself, you know, why, why are things this way? You know, I wish to enjoy, you know, features, you know, fruits of modernity, like watching TV, you know, watching cartoons, or playing video games with my friends. I wish to have safe drinking water flowing from our little kitchen. So that question of why things were this way and what it would take for things to change stayed in my mind, even as I moved out of this region to the city, you know, Harare, uh, to take up uh, high school studies, and of course, eventually moving to South Africa, where I was an international undergraduate and graduate student. This question stayed at the back of my mind. And as I proceeded with my education you know, in political science and political economy, I discovered very interesting facts. For example, most of the resources that I extracted from the rural region, similar to the one that I lived in, actually end up in developed countries, mm -hmm. such as China, India, the European Union, and yes, as you guessed it, is United States. Mm -hmm. So for example, the metals in our electronic devices, in our cars, the oil that powers you know, uh, those same vehicles and aeroplanes, and the jewels that will be exchanged 
throughout this country, this summer, actually originated from, uh, from rural Africa. How many of you watched the coronation of King Charles a few weeks ago? Um, okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to get very shocked. <laughs> Chris Harry lives in California now with us. Um, you'd be interested to know that some of the jewels in the royal crown, in the royal scepter, mm -hmm. actually originate or were taken from South Africa in 1905. And of course, there are calls for those diamonds to be returned. I also realized that, as I mentioned earlier, the countries that produce high value natural resources have experienced the worst outcomes possible. So for example, the two largest oil producers, the two leading oil producers in Africa, Angola and Nigeria, experienced brutal civil wars, military dictatorships, they experienced authoritarian governments, social inequality, and ongoing environmental problems from the extraction of oil. Sierra Leone, which is a leading diamond producer, experienced a 10-year-long brutal civil war, which in fact was dramatized in a movie, Blood Diamond, right? Starring Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> Even my native Zimbabwe is not you know, inspired by the resource curse. Diamonds were discovered in 2006 in addition to lithium and gold. And when this you know, particular diamond uh, field was discovered, there was a diamond rush that lasted a few months. Thereafter, the government sent in the army to drive everybody out, killing other people in the process, and they took control of the area. And to this day, no one knows what, happens, what, happened, what happened to the billions of dollars that were earned from the sale of these diamonds. One day I discovered something very interesting. That is the story of the Bafokeng Kingdom. This is a small rural community that is located in South Africa's northwest province. It consists of 150,000 people living in 29 villages. Now, this community is located in an area with the largest deposits of platinum in the world. That's right. So the largest quantities of, of platinum are found in South Africa, in this particular region. So for some of you who might not be aware, platinum is a precious metal that is used in the manufacture of, 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 of a wide range of, of products. For example, technological gadgets, household appliances like fridges and stoves, our cars, and even dental and medical equipment, you know, surgical, specialized surgical equipment is actually made using platinum. So as you can imagine, this is a metal that is very lucrative. And this kingdom owns a significant chunk of this platinum. So it's a wealthy kingdom. But interestingly enough, they have not experienced the resource curse. Instead, this is one of the wealthiest and prosperous regions in Africa and in the world. For example, they have decent housing, they have electricity, they have internet. So folks watch local TV programs and soapies like, you know, Generations, that's a popular local soap in South Africa. But they also catch up on Hollywood productions, you know, on Netflix. And little kids do not have to push jerry cans of water for miles like I did. They have escaped the resource curse. I also found out that the kingdom provides funding for education for the people and dreamers who would like to start you know, companies have access to grants from the kingdom. Now it was fascinating to find out that the key to this kingdom's prosperity lies in their traditional governance systems. Like Wakanda, <laughs> this kingdom is led by a young athletic king called Leruo Mulutheki. He is also you know, a trained architect apart from being king. <laughs> King Leroux is also the chief executive officer of the kingdom's company, multinational conglomerate, called Royal Bafokeng Holdings. Now, apart from investments in mining, this kingdom is invested in a variety of economic sectors you know, for sustainability. So, for example, they've invested in uh, real estate, they invested in the retail sector, they invested in uh, telecommunications, among other you know, economic, uh, economic activities. 
Currently, the company is valued at $4 billion. And since 2003, the company has invested close to a billion, actually over a billion dollars in various social development programs in this area. So I actually had a chance to visit this kingdom last summer. And it was a fascinating experience. So I visited the administrative headquarters, and while I was there, I met a young lady called Kumo, who is the kingdom's heritage specialist. And she took me around on a brief tour of, of, of the headquarters, and she proudly narrated to me the history of the kingdom and how successive monarchs had foresight and ingenuity, how since the colonial era, when colonial occupation started, the kings engaged in a variety of strategic moves to protect their land and their people from the European colonizers, from post-colonial governments, you know, decades down the line, and also from private companies who tried to dispossess this kingdom of their wealth. I also had a chance to visit the kingdom's privately owned school. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful college set on a hill. It's called Le Bonne College. Uh, it caters to students from K through 12. And while I was there, I was inspired to see young African minds taking full advantage of the school's resources to develop their potential. And remember, this is deep in rural Africa. It was fascinating to see how the classrooms, all the classrooms in that campus, a state-of-the-art technology that we use here on, on college campuses in the United States. And this resonated with me particularly because as an educator, I know, I actually know even from personal experience, the transformative power of education. So the story of the Bafu King filled me with hope. It showed how African kingdoms provide us with a pathway of escaping the resource curse. I realized that kingdoms are not necessarily a relic of the past. They don't only exist in Afrofuturistic imaginations that Black Panther gave us, but they provide answers to some of the greatest challenges that we grapple with today, particularly sustainable, equitable development and how to live in harmony with the environment. At this point, I must emphasize that I'm not, I'm not romanticizing African kingdoms, and, and the Bafokan kingdom is not a utopia. Like every other society, they have their own challenges that they have to grapple with. However, they provide us with important lessons on how to govern natural resources in a better way. So, I hope I've moved your minds, you know, to change uh, your perspectives regarding the role that African kingdoms play in today's societies. And it is also my hope that we can all unite behind a new policy and advocacy agenda that places African indigenous institutions and centuries old wisdom at the center. Because with that, we might collectively be able to enter into the dispensation that we all strive for today. <laughs>